it's just been told to us that this is episode 200 so thank you guys for coming with us on this hey, journey we here made it. same we- age as biden <laughs> all right 200 here here not bad. It looks like we got a, a gift here from the It's Always Sunny guys. Whoa! Four how about that? walls, whiskey, which means, hey, Mark, Sam, and Matthew, we got a little note. This looks like a long note. Holy wow, shit. Jesus Christ. What is that? The declaration? Congratulations on Bodega Cat. Looking forward to talking whiskey one of these days soon on the pod or at the bar. Cheers from Four Walls. Very nice. From the desk of Rob Glenn and Charlie. Wow. Very cool. Yeah, we got a little sig from the boys here. Hey, hey. So, uh, yeah, exciting. We'll put this in the bar and fuck it. We'll try it. Can't wait to give it a shot here. Ooh, that's Come a good in. looking whiskey there. Thanks. It's uh, always sunny, guys. Four Walls whiskey. Then you guys got to come drink some Bodega Cat. You got that right. Do we have other gifts here? Oh, some fans and vi- oh, I recognize this fan. Oh wow, look at this! Hey, Mark and Sam, happy 200 episodes. You come guzzling Nazis. I'm so happy I got to be on your show. Um, a few. I'm not one of the only regulars, baby. So uh, thanks for having me on. We might be drunk, and I hope you guys burn in hell. Yeah. Hey, Sam. And Mark. Ah, oh. um, that's my air conditioner in the background. I should shut that off, but I, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> Happy 200th uh, episode. And, uh, yeah. Not much more I can say. I mean, it's not that big a deal. Good uh, energy. What's up, Bodega Cats? This is former guest and former friend, let's be honest, Joe DeRosa. Uh, I'm just here to wish you congrats on 200 episodes of They Might Be Drunk. I gotta be honest, I <laughs> thought it was about be. 478 at this point, but uh, it's only been 200, which means there are a lot more to go. But I gotta be honest, for a drinking podcast, 200 is a landmark. <laughs> I don't think you are drunk. I don't think you're drinking enough. You sound a bit too motivated. He's got a, a drinking point. podcast, you know, you hit about 16 eps, and then you say, ah, what do you say we celebrate? We did enough. Any- anyway, guys, look... I've made enough ha ha. This is like one of his bits. It's never ended. Congrats, <laughs> Sam and Mark and the crew, Salicuse and everybody else. We might be drunk. I definitely am right now. Matt Peters. Hey, Sam and Mark. Uh, Congratulations on 200 episodes. Uh, I'm sure every other comedian has thought of something funny to say. I have not. So I just wanted to say congratulations. I'm trying to be genuine. And uh, yeah, see you around, Sam. I'll see you. I'll go upstairs and see you now. Oh, neighbor. Uh, yeah, I'm taking a serious shit. And that is not going to stop me from congratulating Mark and Sam. I actually heard it hit the water. comedians on the 200th episode of We Might Be Drunk. Fuck, I love you guys, man. Congrats. Oh, wow. Never thought I'd do that. Congratulations, we're going to be drunk. Oh, 200 I'm in the background. I've been on that what podcast five different times, and they're the this. best five episodes they've ever done. Uh, he has no idea I'm doing this. Congratulations, boys. I had no idea. Mark, Sam, the We Might Be Drunk wow. family, I just we want to say congratulations on 200 episodes. Here. I am so honored to just be a little piece of what you guys God have put together. I went back to our episode <laughs> where we gave bar and food recommendations, and the comment section glowing. Look at this one from Wu Su Dude. The Jew levels are off the scale on this one. <laughs> we did it. Listen, I heard back from so many of the bars and restaurants we talked about. Even in Belfast, Flau Pizza, they, they messaged me. It, they were like crying. They're like, oh, I my God. That. We can't believe it. You mentioned us and we might be drunk. Our business is through the roof. So you're saving lives. You're helping people. Also, I do have to give an amendment to that story. I found out. That guy's wife is alive and well. He he made it sound like she was dying, and she didn't. She's like she had like the cold. So that is a little the cold. If anyone remembers, you know the story I told. Otherwise, congratulations, best to you both and the whole gang to two hundred more. Mark and Sam, congratulations uh, on your two hundred celebrity level is really falling off. You guys are two very special retards. There you go. 
What's up? We might be drunk Kelvin podcast. Gasoline. Wow! Congratulations on your 200th episode. I'll always be a fan. I'll always keep watching. Even when you start doing M and A meetings, I'll tune in. Peace. <laughs> M and A meetings. Hey, I'm Fred Stoller. Is that Fred the Stoller, the original OG anti PC rebel. Oh, it's coming comedian. through the headphones. We'll, we'll fix it in post. And I'm wow. here to wish uh, Mark Fred Stoller of uh, Dumb and, and Dumber Sam fame. Morrow. He's on Seinfeld. Hey, congratulations on yes. 200 episodes of the podcast. How much is that we on a uh, cameo? <laughs> this is actually the biggest thing that much has happened that. to me in a long time. Is that a Pip time. shirt? Why well, he's got a Pip's Part of a congratulations cool. montage, and I, I hope you know who I am, house. Sam and Mark, and I make the cut. I've seen clips of your podcast. Hey, hey. Mark, Sam, Winnie, the whole crew. Hey. Congratulations on 200 episodes of We Might Be Drunk. That's a lot of drinking you've done. I'm proud of you guys for carrying on the torch. And Winnie, I mean, just a media presence like no other. It's the tongue <laughs> hanging out. Even Myrtle's a fan, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Myrtle. Tells you that old gals still got a career. It's pretty good. Congratulations on 200 episodes. Thank you. Don't drive. Hey, Mark and Sam, congrats <laughs> on 200 episodes. Two well, of the, the best uh, buddies, two attractiveness of the best comics, disparity there the is pretty jarring. Pals. I should have rehearsed this. Congrats, boys. Hey guys, Hanley. congratulations! I forgot he did 2000 comedy. shows that is phenomenal, and I've I've listened and watched every single episode. I remember when Whitney was just a little puppy. Whitney, hey guys, Harland here. Congratulations <laughs> hey, Harland. on the two hundredth episode of We Might Be Drunk. I was racking my brain trying to figure out what kind of present to get you, but uh, <laughs> look at this. Oh man. I got your palm tree. <laughs> uh, beautiful palm. She's about uh, 25 feet high. Uh, she gets ripe coconuts in the winter. And she smells like hair. the back of a baby seal. That's his, that's his house. It lives way up in the hills. Burnt Hollywood. out sea cucumber. Happy congratulations. 200. I wish you. Hope you get to 201. Love you guys. Stay <laughs> drunk. Stay funny. And stay the hell away from my wife, freaks. <laughs> Mark, Sam, congrats hey, we got on the brown 200 guy. episodes of We Might Be Drunk. 200 episodes. I think <laughs> what at are this you, point, ice? you are drunk. <laughs> uh, here's a 200 more, guys. I should not do this while I drive. Hey, Sam and Mark. Dating by Blaine here. Congrats on 200 episodes. Amazing. I'm so Texas. thankful I was able to be a tiny part of that and answer all your audience's questions on butt stuff. See you all soon. <laughs> That's good. Hey, Mark and Sam. Congrats on 200 episodes together. No better combination than two traumatized men and a lot of alcohol. <laughs> hey, congrats hey, to look the at this. Wow. gayer, better joke writing versions of us. 200 episodes. That's ah, hilarious. You guys are smart. And what are they at Home Depot? Handsome. You guys are killing it. You are. I don't want to do this video. You know? I'm joking. <laughs> sort of over. I feel like no, I'm No, that was so much better. Oh, for real? Yeah. Just tell them, fuck off. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not happy for your success. Hey, congratulations to you guys. That's Just, so insincere. Do yeah. the regular how you really For real, how I feel? Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah, send this. Send this. <laughs> That's great. What is it? Oh, that's nice. What do, what do we have here? We got a box, folks. We is got this going to be gift. poor Osos? What's in the box? What? Oh, my God. Oh, get out of town. Holy shit. What? I'm wearing this tonight. Where'd you make these? Who sent this? Look at that. Hide the bodies. That's the merch guy. I love it. We got a bunch. All right, I'm How wearing one, too. How killer is that? Oh, my God. I got a medium. Wow, that is so killer. This is right up my anal. I love These it. These are all larges. 200 up. I mean, this is better than anything I own. Here's an XL for you, I think. No, that's you. You're, you're a triple. So, really? I got a large, yeah. Well, well, we'll try them on. Thank you, Hide the Bodies. Very cool. I mean, that is amazing. Love this. All right. This well, is killer. Uh, thank you so much. And. Guess what? We have a guest coming in who's one of our favorite comics. We're so pumped to do 200 with him. Living legend. One of the best comics working, and it's an honor to have him. So uh, enjoy. See you soon. All right, let's do it. 
So you guys do what I like too? Huh? Yeah, you yeah, drink what I drink? Yeah, yeah uh, you're the guest. Good. Add some Pepto-Bismol. <laughs> <laughs> we have that. Are we Pepsi AC? We're fucking pussies, <laughs> dude. Are we on? Are we rolling? Let's oh, hey, great. We got all that. Hey, all right. We might be drunk. We're here. We're queer. We, we got the whole gang, and we got our pal... Brian Regan. Hey. Brian Regan. How are you guys? Good. Good, man. Thank you for having me. Sure. Hey, thank you. Yeah, I know you guys invited me a while back. It didn't quite work out schedule-wise, but uh, happy to be here now. Hell yeah. <laughs> Good to have you. And Good to full, have you. full beard. You look like you're, uh, you're prepping for the doomsday. <laughs> yeah. Dunk, what's the uh, guy in Harry Potter? Dumble, Dumbledore. Dumbledore. Yeah. The old guy. I think, no, I think you got it right the first time. Dumbledore? Dumbledore, I think. Dumbledore. <laughs> I don't know. That's why I corrected. I got it right, and then I corrected it and made a mistake. Who had that, that great Dumbledore joke? Ted. Was it Ted? Alexandro? Yeah. yeah. Dumbledore's gay? Yeah. Yeah. I can't believe he's gay. You can believe he's a wizard, but you can't believe he's gay? <laughs> Ted. We've, we've quoted Ted on here a decent amount. Ted's the man. Great yeah, joke. You know Ted fun. Alexandro. Sure. Uh, one of my favorite jokes of his is uh, up, a friend upgrading responses. So you, oh, yes. when you go, hey, how you doing? Uh, okay, good, good. <laughs> so you're doing good, huh? Yeah, I suppose. Great. <laughs> uh, all right, you're doing great, huh? Yeah, fantastic. I don't know that one. Oh, great enough. And then and then he'll he'll do the next part when if someone's are doing too good. He's like, how are you? Amazing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he has to downgrade him too. I love that bit. Tap the brakes. Ted little. came to my college when I was in school and I got to open for him and he was awesome. He was a really uh, sweet man. Good man. Good dude. And he killed. It was, you were a student? Yeah. And the, you were doing comedy or getting yeah. into comedy? Yeah, he o had a great opener. He opened, it was in New Orleans at Katrina, and I remember we opened with the at joke. At Katrina, like it's a... You know, <laughs> no, like right, right after Katrina. Oh, man. okay. At Katrina, yeah, we were drowning. I studied Katrina. It was Katrina. weird. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we were underwater, but he still brought <laughs> the heat. No, he uh, he opened, he goes, so I guess it's been, I, I, I've always died, been dying to come down here ever since I heard about what happened, and uh, I guess it's been about a year, and that just crushed, and you're like, all right. Uh, or just, sometimes it's just the fucking pause, you know? <laughs> it's much better than Daniel Tosh's Jeez. joke. All right. What's that? Daniel Tosh came down, like, right after Katrina, and he goes, uh, ah, this city needed a good bath. And you're like, jeez, <laughs> how about a hello? <laughs> but hey, sorry, I ruined the toast. Good to be here. Yay! Thanks, all right. Ryan Regan. Ryan. Yeah, I, I I tried a joke down there and was like uh, Katrina came through here, huh? I'm 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 happy about all of the destruction. <laughs> 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 and uh, <laughs> nothing. No, nothing. Damn. Damn. Nothing. Well, you know. You know, I'm like I probably didn't pause. At the right <laughs> yeah, did something wrong. Yeah, something's off. Yeah, I open with things are really bad, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's weird how bad things are. You no, guys aren't ready to laugh yet. I see. <laughs> when I first moved here, we did a roast of a friend. He's also from New Orleans, and a guy from Michigan roasted us. And he goes, "I got drunk with him. He wet the bed. I got drunk with him and wet the bed. What the hell, are you New Orleans guys? What's in the water down there? <laughs> oh yeah, it's your houses." <laughs> I was like, "That's a great joke. That's good. <laughs> yeah, good time." Everybody's laughing except the people in New Orleans. <laughs> yeah, well, hey. I'm, it's hey, been a while. We've guys. had a minute. I'm from there. They can handle it. It's been, it was 05. Oh, I got a coaster over here and everything, man. Yeah. Hey, all right. Fantastic. Yeah. I wasn't thinking to use one, but I'm going to use one. Did you, uh, forgive me for my ignorance, but uh, Mexican people, no. Yeah, I feel like you, you didn't start in New York. Florida, Start, right? Started in Fort Lauderdale. Yeah. Whoa! The comic strip in New York opened a sister club, if you will. I don't mm. know why I'm calling it a sister club. It could be a brother club. could be a, a they? another club. Yeah. Sure. So they opened what I called a sister club <laughs> in Fort Lauderdale, and that's where I started. I grew up in Miami, Florida. Drove up to uh, the comic strip to audition. Yep. And uh, you got there during the day. And you would draw numbers. I knew nothing about anything, you know. Yeah. And there, all these people out front, I drew like number seven or something. And uh, right after, and the show was going to be that night. So like four or five people came up to me and said, I'll trade, I'll trade. Oh. And I'm like, I don't know what number seven means, <laughs> but I ain't trading. Yeah. And it meant you went up in the middle of the show. Nice gooey middle. And uh, so that was my first time on stage. So the whole show is auditioners. No, they actually had uh, headliners. The comic strip in Fort Lauderdale, this was like before comedy 
had really exploded around the country, so nobody knew how to do a show. They had yeah. three co-headliners, huh. all of whom did 45 minutes. Shut up. So they had a local opener do 10. No, they had a local MC do like 10, a local opener do another 10, then three 45-minute sets. Wow. Jesus, poor audience. I'm telling you. <laughs> And then the on a Monday, it was open mic night, so they would put open micers in between all of that. Jeez. So can you imagine being the third comic, the third 45-minute set? People have seen like oh, two and a half hours of show before you even hit the stage. Well, that was back when the club owner was just like, let's sell as many drinks and chicken nuggets as we can. So like, get put as, put people up there for hours. They want it's it's like they wanted the show to outlast the audience. Right, right. You know yeah. what I mean? Like uh, just people just kept leaving and leaving. But I, d I did the audition at the comic strip, and it was like a big one for me at the time. And I remember it was like two hundred comics at this lottery. Remember that shit? Oh yeah, the lottery. And, and I remember uh, going on. I got you go six comics after the regular show, so you'd be like mm. a good two and a half hours in right. the evening for the crowd. And then they'd be like, all right, do you guys want to watch some terrible comics? And the crowd's like, uh, no, fine, yeah, whatever. Yeah. They were nice enough to stay. <laughs> and it was us six, and I drew number six, and I was like, fuck this, this is going to be rough. They're not going to be here. But then, you know, everyone was doing, like, not well, but well enough. And the guy who got five right before me had a full-on nervous breakdown no. on stage. He walked 70 out of the 80 people. Get out of here! It, during his set, he was just like... I'm fucking bad at this. Oh my God. <laughs> I fucking suck. He just started freaking out and wow. they all just filed out. And I was like, this, I, this wasn't meant to be. Wow. That was me. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. Well, at the comic strip, uh, on Monday night, they would slip the open micers in between. Yeah. I'm talking about the Fort Lauderdale one. Um, but every other night of the week, it was open seven nights a week. They would let the locals go on after the show, like you're talking about. And, uh, and we were new and local and not very good, you know. And the guy who ran the club, Joe Mullen, at one point said, all right, from now on, when the three headliners are over, like if I was emceeing, he would say, I want you to go on stage. He wanted to draw a clear line. He goes, I want you to go on stage and say, that's it for our show. <laughs> we do have some local yeah. comedians who are coming up to do a few minutes each. If you guys want to leave, we understand. But if you want to hang out and give them an audience, you're welcome to do so. Wow. So It's always a tough intro, Charity. <laughs> right, right. And about 75% of the audience would get up and leave. Yeah. Of course. You know, because the MC had just said, that's it for our show. But curiosity. And like, then they would let us go. True. Sometimes, like, I don't know. If I was in the audience I'd be and I had nothing to do the next day, I think I'd be like, I kind of want to see what the hell this I would. is. Yeah, sure. But they don't do this with strippers. All right, guys. <laughs> Maybe. That was the real show. Next up, we got some pigs. These are girls. We don't, we don't, we don't claim them. They're She's not in girls. shape yet. You're, yeah. welcome, you're welcome to hang around and look at them. <laughs> some stripper the goes up. They're like, I can't fucking open. do this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we got some real bridge trolls coming in. They, they're, not, they're not booked. Uh -huh. But yeah, but yeah, that's comedy for you. But that was what 64? 64 years ago. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, what was that? Was early eighties? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. wow. You've been but at it 80, for eighty one or something like that. Yeah. Wait, so you saw a boom though. The boom was what eighty six or something. When I wanted to be a comedian, the only comedy clubs were in New York City and Los Angeles. Wow. I, I was getting ready to move to New York, and then the comic strip. The Sister Club yeah. <laughs> opened up in Fort Lauderdale. I remember seeing the ad in the Miami Herald. And of all the ads I've ever seen in my life, this one like jumped out at me more. Sure. Than it's like a comedy club opens, comic strip comedy club opens in Fort Lauderdale, open mic nights on Monday. And I was like, oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah. There it is. Fort Lauderdale is good audiences. Great crowd. Every, every time I'm there, I'm always like, oh yeah, you guys are fucking, I, I like the, because you know, Florida is like a real... It's a hit or miss. It's a hit state. or miss. Mixed bag. Some Miami. of those cities, Miami can be tough. Yeah. Naples is horrible, <laughs> as, as I've been through. <laughs> uh, Fort Myers is tough. But then, like Orlando, uh, Fort Lauderdale, Tampa, like. Killer. All, all killer. You Even know? Jacksonville's good. Jacksonville's fun. good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's that other one? Up, up in the panhandle. Tallahassee, Tallahassee, I did. I had a great time. But yeah, you get two, the lower you get, the worse it gets. Yeah. But, I always say Florida is upside down. If you draw a line through Florida, like right around Orlando, everything north of that has a southern vibe. 
Yeah. yeah. And everything south of that is has a northern vibe. Yeah, It's like yeah. transplanted New Yorkers and stuff like that. Right. But then you also have Cuban population, Haitian population, you know. So southern Florida is like upside down. It's That's a great point. The Cubans are just, they're Puerto Ricans. Like they, you know, it's, it's pretty similar, you know. Yeah, yeah. But then, you know, uh, you're coming up in the 80s. Like, who were the guys that you were looking at? You're like, that made you want to do this? Uh, Jerry Seinfeld was a guy that I followed as an auditioner. I, 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 I auditioned five times. One of them was my, with my In brother, New York? Dennis. You guys know my brother, yeah. Oh, Dennis. Yeah, very funny guy. Hilarious. Yeah. Stand up. So I auditioned like three times, and then one time I said to my brother, I said, why don't we try it as a comedy team? Oh, oh no. So we go to the comic strip to audition as a comedy team. Mm. We drew our number and we followed one of the three headliners and the guy's name was Jerry Seinfeld. Neither wow. of us had ever seen him before. He went on stage and absolutely killed. Wow. And we were like, you know, we're laughing, enjoying him. And uh, then we were like looking at each other, holy shit, we gotta follow this guy. Yeah. So they said, that's it. Yeah. Enjoy Jerry Seinfeld. Uh, nice hand for Jerry Seinfeld. Now we have uh, uh, some auditioners coming up here. Brian Regan and Dennis Regan. We went on stage and completely died. <laughs> completely well, it was died. your first time going up to, as a team. It was our first time going up as a team. It's fucking hard. Yeah, that's a different animal. And I remember I had told Dennis, you know, that because he was worried. He goes, well, how do we know when to get off stage? And I said, well, they're going to put a light up. You know, a light means that it's time to wrap up. Sure. And basically the whole show, he just kept asking, when are they going to turn that light on? <laughs> Damn, that's <laughs> never a good sign. Right. Shit. Well, so. did you get your, did you converse with Jerry and go, no, tell me everything, you big Jew? What was it like? Well, what was interesting is I remember watching him, and and I was disillusioned because I'm thinking, well, if this guy isn't famous, what am I trying Ooh. to get into? I'm trying to get into this comedy world. Interesting. This was like the best guy I'd ever seen as a comedian. But right. he had been on Carson at that point. No. Really? Wow. He did his first Carson like a week or two after we saw him. Damn. So he's so, probably running that. Yeah. So it, I remember like going, okay, the comedy thing is fair. You know, this right. guy's really good. Right. Now he's on The Tonight Show. If you're good enough, you know, you but can also, make some success. That was probably like early '80s. It was it was like six comics, six right. famous comedians. You know, it was it Eddie Murphy, Richard Pryor, Carlin, yeah. and Woody Allen, Cosby? I don't know. There weren't a ton of household names. Yeah, comedians. a third of them ended up becoming uh, maybe rapists. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Carlin. <great. laughs> um, but yeah, so I think breaking in was tough back then. And you had what, like three avenues? You had Carson, you had HBO, right? That's about it, man. Yeah. Maybe a Letterman. I don't know. So I worked there as a, you know, dishwasher and busboy and the whole thing, and uh, they would let me go on at the end of the night. So wow. Really cool. And was was, De was that Dennis's first time on stage? The, the that was Dennis's first time doing stand up, and I think he was so <laughs> thrown by how bad it went that he's like, I don't know if I want this in my life. So I continued auditioning by myself. And then I started making some progress. He was doing some other things. And then a couple years later, he decided to get back into it. Damn. Wow. That's wild. So you yeah. just kept, you just stuck with it. Yeah. And um, moved to LA? New York. Oh, you moved to New York eventually. Yeah. The story okay. I heard from Nick DiPaolo is that he moved from Boston to New York and he just like packed his bags down, went to the comedy cellar, saw you on stage murdering and was like, I might have to leave. <laughs> so you did it to him. You did yeah. the Seinfeld move to him. That's a good feeling. Ah, well, that's a nice compliment. But uh, the 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 person I would say was uh, that I saw perform in New York, where I was like, man, some people know how to get some laughs. Mario Cantone. Yeah. Oh yeah. I went into Catch Rising Star. I was in New York for like a week or two. I went into Catch Rising Star. I hadn't passed there. I just was watching comedians. Mario Cantone got on stage. And like destroyed. Like wow. I remember going, I, I've never seen laughs like at this level. And he was just like a machine. <laughs> wow. Like, like bam, bam, bam. And I'm like, I gotta go buy some notebooks. Yeah, I gotta go gay. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta figure something out. <laughs> Damn, but remember, did you guys see the Bill Hicks doc yeah. that doctor came out? Well, he no. said, oh, it's great. It's yeah, fun. It was cool. Scream, I think it's called. It's called I thought it was called American. 
American Scream, Ameri- yeah, something like that. But uh, he, yeah. what is it? There oh, it is. shit, I was way off. Where did I get Scream? All right, American. But he uh, he talked about when the comedy club opened, he was like, it was like a gift from like the gods opened the clouds and put a comedy club in Houston in his town. And he, he went in there and he's like, I can't believe this is a thing that exists where adults spend money. Because he was 14. Yeah. Well, and there's a great story about Bill Hicks. He said, Ooh, uh, lay it on me. He uh, did a show one time, and a guy came up to him after the show and said, uh, Hey, we didn't come here to think. <laughs> <laughs> so Bill Hicks said, Tell me where you do go to think, and I'll do my act there. Ooh. <laughs> pretty good. Ooh, nice. You have to go to the guy's toilet. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Yeah, right. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, stand yeah. in front of the, this toilet. <laughs> Did How you... about now? You thinking a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> Did you see a bunch of other killers coming up in Florida? Sam Kinison. Wow. Uh, Sam Kinison performed before he was a name. Uh, was he a dude that immediately were like, this dude's fucking incredible? It was interesting. The club was open seven nights a week. One show he would destroy, the next night walk the room. Wow. Interesting. Night after that, destroy, next night walk the room. Like either a crowd got into the wavelength and wrote it, or they were like taken aback and didn't want any more of it. Whoa. It's interesting. I, I, from him performing there, I realized how much audiences like – Everybody thinks they're an individual making a decision in an audience, but everybody's influenced by how everybody else is reacting. Oh, good point. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, like, you think, oh, I think this guy's funny, or I don't think this guy's funny. You're influenced by the people around you, laughing or not laughing. If they don't laugh, you're more inclined to go, eh, I guess they're right. That's a great If they're point. laughing, you're more inclined to go, okay, I guess he's funny. True. And that's why we go, that crowd sucked. Right. Because as a whole, they got influenced by each other, and it Correct. changed everything. They all made up the, the uh, they did that group thing. You know, when you see those birds flying, like yeah, ten thousand yeah, birds, right. and they're all doing this. Are they all making individual decisions? Right, that's quite a coincidence that they're all going around. You, Audiences wait, are like that. That's well, a good when point. when you're having a bad set, do you address it, or do you just kind of think like I'm going to keep doing my thing, I'm going to build momentum, I'm going to get them? What do you do? I've what I try to do is. Pretend that I'm sitting in the middle of the audience mm. and go, all right, clearly I don't know how to make these people laugh. <laughs> right. But I know what I think is funny. So I just I just go, what would I what would I laugh at if I was out there? So it calms me down and at least I can you know how you st- you can step on the gas too much if you're losing a crowd, yeah, you step yeah. on the gas and like you, you start chasing them, which yep. is a bad move. So it'll teach me, don't chase these people. Just do what I think is funny. Sometimes I can turn a crowd around. Sometimes I don't, but at least I'm staying true to what I think is funny. Yeah. You know what I mean? Interesting. What really sucks is when you put yourself out there and you bomb to yourself. And, and you go, well, yes. now I don't think I'm funny. I'm yes. Bombing yeah, you sell me. yourself out a little. I, I, realize, I realize how much I suck. <laughs> you ever have I'm the, seeing it from the other perspective. You ever think where you kill... And you get off, and your friend or your opener is like, "That was great." You're like, "It wasn't right for me." Oh, sure. They had a good time, but I was off, and I wasn't where I wanted to be. But they'll then never there's know. a weird thing. It's like, well, what is our job, right? I mean, is it to entertain? Is it to be true to ourselves? I mean, hopefully, you find a, a place in the middle where yeah, that balance. was me, and they liked it, but, right? But sometimes you do like a private event type thing, and you're like, "I just got to survive this." Oh, right. totally, you know? totally. You must get a million of those because you're clean. Well. Anytime, if I do interviews, I always talk about how much I hate corporate shows, yeah. which is so bad for me, for, for my agents who are trying to book me on corporate shows. Yeah. So, well, we heard him in the We Might Be Drunk podcast say he doesn't like them, so we decided not to book him. But uh, nah. at paper. least an audience in a regular venue, they're coming out to see me. Right. But a corporate show, they're out there for another reason, and I'm hit or miss, man. Really? Yeah. I feel like you I mean, cruise. No, I can, I can, you know, from doing it, I've learned enough. Have I have enough skills, if you will, to be able to force my way through it? But that doesn't mean I'm having any fun. No, oh, no one's having fun on those. You know, that's yeah. a chain gang. You're getting whipped. <laughs> you know, 
Uh, I mean, some of them, some of them, you catch sure. a good, you catch a good crowd, and you go, okay, this is a good time. But uh, but back to your crowd hive mind thing. Somebody once told me, I forgot who this was. Some smart, funny guy said, if you got ten percent of the audience on your side, you can get all of them. Like if you have ten of your ten percent of your people show up, and that's ten percent of the crowd, they can sway an entire five hundred thousand seat room. Right. I I I go along with that because. If somebody's not laughing, they're going to hear other people laughing, and they don't want to miss out. Right. So, all right. Well, obviously something's going on here, and they're going to be, they're going to be more interested in tuning in to try to find the right wavelength. Yeah. We, Whereas if nobody's laughing, then there there's nothing to there's no reason to try to tune. In. Yes. Exactly. We we were at the comedy cellar, and I was like bitching. I was like, ah, the, I killed in this room. Same material, bombed in this room. And Colin Quinn goes. You never done stand up before? <laughs> <laughs> like that's all that's constantly all the time happening. What are you talking about? This is the first time it's ever happened to you? I'm but like, it is it's it frustrating. Is, but it's he's frustrating right. when you're building because you get excited about a new joke and then it fucking bombs ten minutes later. And yeah. You're like, so no, yeah, it's it's still annoying. It's I'm frustrating. With you. I'm, I'm still bothered by it. Yeah. It happened to me last night. There you go. There was a club in uh uh Akron Akron, Ohio or Northeast Ohio. And the, uh, you know, it was a place that wasn't built to be a comedy club. So it had two levels. So the stage was here mm. and you had an audience, half your audience was over here, like on your level. And then there was like a little staircase down <laughs> to the other half of the audience. What is this, MC Escher's club? Uh-huh. <laughs> so these people are so low, they can't even see these people. Like, and, and I've, I remember having shows there where I got, Two different reactions in the same show. <laughs> like I'm bombing down there, but yeah. killing over here at the same time. That's hilarious. So is this funny or not? You know? Yeah, it's so <clears throat> frustrating because, like, you're. I always say you're a basketball player. If it goes in, it's two points. Yeah. That's it. This is like the same joke. Gets two points here. Gets zero points there. What's well, entertainment? It's, you know? I get yeah, subjective. Like about, you see a movie, half the room could love the movie. I mean, that's just what yeah, we're doing. You know? I guess that's true. Yeah. I guess you just write a joke. You go, that joke works or it doesn't. So then when you have to fluctuate, you're like, well, what the fuck am I doing here? I know, but you've done jokes that got an applause break on Fallon, and then you bring it to a bar show, and they're like, yeah, that sucked. That's a good point. I mean, it's just, yeah, it's it's not just, but that's, right. but that's showbiz. I've yeah. always thought that, I mean, who gets to decide whether something is funny or not? So my attitude is if one person in the world thinks something is funny, then it's funny. Mm. That doesn't mean other people agree, but it made one brain laugh. Yeah. So if you think of something and you think it's funny, okay, it's funny. Uh-huh. Ted Bundy. It like, might not I work. Think this is funny. It, it, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is working. I mean, you might have to drop it from your act. You, yeah. You can't just plow through an audience and go, I, I could give a damn what you think. You do have to find things that they agree with to keep in your act. Enough of them agree with. Correct. Yeah, it's got to be the majority. Because you can't have three guys going, <laughs> you know, in a theater, that's not enough. You know, you don't want to be like, that guy gets it. <laughs> you know, everybody hates that guy. If well, I was in the middle of the audience, yeah. <laughs> I'd think it was funny. Right. But that, those, you also like have to be, you know, concerned to be, you know, with being one of those comics, comics who crushes in those coffee house shows and then goes to any real room and can't fucking connect. That is kind of satisfying it, for it, me. Yeah. When we would like Mark and I at open mics would do such kind of like bum bump jokes. Right. Our jokes were so kind of like, well, that's the joke. Set up and, punch. and then we'd see guys kind of be loose and just like, I don't give a shit and yeah. murder. But then when they'd go to the, like Caroline's at the strip, they would eat shit. Yes. And it was like, all right, at least like those L's were for something that we yeah. took, you know? Oh, yeah, totally. And all those people are, are homeless now. <laughs> so fuck them. I've always wanted to, you know, there's like playing to the crowd or playing to the back of the room. And uh, both of them are fun. But I always thought I was a pig because I wanted both. <laughs> I wanted the crowd and the people in the back of the room to think it was funny. Well, like we I all want everybody. I want everybody to enjoy it. Yeah. That's how I feel. I want everybody to enjoy it. Like I used to I remember when the alt scene was big. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know, two thousand five, six, and I would see these club comics, like hardcore club comedians, go to the alt shows where I was performing, and they would bring a they 
bring, bring the Bible and open it up and make fun of it. And they thought they had to be weird. They thought they had to have a thing. But I'm like, no, no, Gafkin comes in here and, and rips mm. with uh, jokes, you know. But uh, I think people would think they had to get kooky and alternative in these certain rooms. But like, no, we're just trying to make everybody laugh. Don't try to make these alt people laugh with your alt bullshit. I go see, go both places with the same funny stuff. I see a lot of the club comics going to the alt rooms like with the notepad and just be yes. like, so what else? I'm like, you did that joke on Letterman. <laughs> <laughs> That's your fucking A material. Right, right. But they'd be like, is that anything? I don't know. <laughs> I know. That's a bit of a cheat code. <laughs> you know, they go, I'm going to try a new one. It's not great. I don't know why I went into Trump. I'm going to do a new one. But I'm going to try a new one. I'm, I'm working on it. And the crowd's like, do it, do it. And then it's like a proven, tried and true bit. You're like, come on, you you lowered the bar that, there. That way about the uh, the the show on Comedy Central. I can't believe this is happening. Ari Shafir. Oh, show. this is not happening. This is not happening. Yeah, yeah. Um, you had a great story on that. Yes. Well, thank you. The bomb threat. Uh, no, no, that was Sal Volcano. Oh, no, that I was. <laughs> Oh, no, it might have been Jim Brewer, actually. Jim Brewer, sorry. Yeah, Jim that's Brewer a, that was a great story, threat. too. Sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, what was yours again? What was yours? I remember loving it, though. Mine was about, uh, I mean, I'm not going to do the whole thing, but it Do the whole about, story, uh, 20 minutes. Having to do comedy on center ice at an N NHL game. Ah. Uh, and getting booed, getting literally booed off the ice. Dog on a Zamboni. There you go. Dog on a Zamboni. But I had been told when I was supposed to do the show that you're supposed to just do a, a story- that I thought was not in your act. So I, I worked on this Zamboni story, you know, like, uh, I mean, that's a true story. Mm -hmm. But then I started realizing a lot of people were actually just doing bits from their act, oh. pretending like they were stories. And I was like, well, felt like cheating to me. Yeah, I'm with you. I did a brand new story that I worked out for that show. Ari told me a tell went on one of the ones at uh, the improv when he just did it. And he just dipped, not the Comedy Central one, but just the improv storytelling show. Yeah. And Attell would be, he's like, I don't do stories. He's like, just do the show. And Attell goes up. He's like, all right, this next one is a story about a midget. <laughs> <laughs> just be a short joke. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't tell stories either. So that was hard for me. I don't know how you felt. It was hard for me, too. Yeah. I would I would practice it at the end of my shows, you know, the story, and I would tell the audience, "Hey, I'm working on a story for this uh, TV thing," and so I practiced it, but it still wasn't something that was part of my act normally. Same, same, which was kind of cool to get out of your comfort zone, but it's still not my cup of jizz. Yeah, it's tough. Some people, I mean, it's just all they do. Yeah, like, like Jim Jeffries, I feel like could just tell a story like. Like oh, just go tell a story. He'd make he'd tell a story at a bar, and that's just how he is. But the whole bar's listening. Yeah, but like yeah, we're kind of joking. Can't, yeah, it's, I can't either. I'm very uh, meticulous uh, about the words and the moments and the beats, and it's kind of like <clears throat> a curse in a way. Because then when you're just hanging out at a party or something like that, people kind of expect you to be uh, funny, and it's like, well, I'm not. You know, when I work on an act or a joke, it's like you put a lot of work and effort into it and you try to make it sound like it's just off kind of the top sure. of your head. But that's not the way I'm able to really just, I can't do that in just normal life. That's another thing rock stars don't have to worry about. You know, Slash walks into a party, no one's like, give this guy an ax. Yeah. <laughs> just start shredding. Like they can just hang out and get blown. Yeah. <laughs> we got to be life. on. Yeah. What's that? It's a good life. <laughs> yeah, it's a great life. Great life. Or it was, but now I got to make you uncomfortable here. Uh oh, <laughs> it, it's working. Okay, <laughs> uh, don't you feel like you 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 might have the most copycats? I see a lot of people doing Regan, which is a huge compliment. You know, it's flattering, but I think you might uh, tells up there, obviously. Yeah. But I think you might be number one. Well, I think Burr's got a lot. Burr's got a lot, but Burr's Hedberg younger. Had a, Hedberg had a lot Hedberg, back in the day. Ton of copycats. It's just I think we all kind of came up during that era of like Comedy Central half hours. You, I remember yours and uh, oh, huge and Attell and Hedberg and all those Ger Greg Giraldo and who else was? I mean, oh Tosh, yeah, so many of those. Right, right. And but you you have those old like the yellow ones, the sun, and then like you two. I do the, the you dumb, do the dumb character, the <laughs> dumb guy with the kind of the back, the shoulders go up a little. Yeah, I mean that is so uh, copied and in 
imitated. Well, and I think on accident. I don't think people are stealing. I think you're just such an influence. Well, I I, I appreciate that. Um, Your I, cadence I, is infectious. Yeah, it's a good way to say it. I've I've noticed occasionally we're all. I remember doing a show one time, and it was like two local. It was, I'm in a comedy club. I had two other local comedians who I'd never met before. And I remember sitting in the back of the audience going, I'm following two Brian Regan. Oh, that was dead. I mean, they were similar, you know, like similar in style and. Uh, and, and a guest spot who's Jackie the Joke Man Martling. That's... <laughs> <laughs> but I, there, there is a difference between outright stealing sure. and, and Influence. getting influenced. And I think if you are. Heck, you know, I, I probably was influenced by some people growing up. You just who who influenced you? Do you think uh, John Fox? Um, I've heard stories. I mean, he was, the he road was like, dog. Yeah, I've heard many uh, tales about this he, guy. He was, uh, he was an animal. High energy. I, I think I might have kicked up my energy after watching him. Uh, not material. I mean, he was like a very dirty act. But mm. um, you know, I, I there he is, John Fox. Oh yeah, right there. Can we play a, a bit? I just want to get a maybe watch him. He was legendary, Regan. man. Yeah, he passed away a few funny. years ago. I Everybody, didn't he, I think he did a Marin episode. Oh, really? I think he did. People rave about this guy. Yeah, he was something else, man. I've never watched a second of John. Me neither. Fox. I don't know. This is another. We're gonna watch. Oh well, let's uh, let's get to a. Oh gee, remember how long? That's he's... not John. Fuck. There we go. <laughs> there you go. Wow. Yeah, hey. he's animated. Party. <laughs> I already kind of like it. I'm already it. laughing. Well, I think he also influenced Tom Arnold. <laughs> so come on down and catch some rays. How are things in Newport? This is Gookie in Newport. <laughs> Party! <laughs> the waves are three to four feet, and they're almost primo bitching. <laughs> so come on down and catch some rays. How are things in San Francisco? Yeah. <laughs> That's good 80s this company. Is <laughs> this is Charles from San Francisco. Oh, the waves are so gnarly. This guy's gold. I'm dying. Ah, well, what's he doing now? We gotta get him on he's, the show. He's dead, dude. Ah, you see that thing? Hey, it's no secret that we love sheath underwear. Let's see if he's got it right now. One day I don't wear it. All right, hold on. on. Now, if I don't have it, we got to kill ourselves. Look at that we sheath. Go. This is my wife's. Uh, it's no secret that we love sheath underwear. They cradle love your balls. Them. They wick away moisture. They make your dick look great. Everything you want in a pair of panties. Sheath has two pouches, one for your dong, the other one for your sack. It's a comfort like you've never felt before. Hey, hey, look, we're two uncomfortable people just in life generally. But you know what's not uncomfortable is this big old hog. I'll tell you that right now. It's separated from my balls. It's like me and my wife. They hate each other. You got to give us some square footage. Not only is Sheath amazing and comfortable, the quality is fantastic. They're made by our pal and Army U.S. Sergeant Robert Patton. Grab yourself a pair or two and support a good guy who made a good product. You cannot go wrong. We all wear them. Everybody wears them. Love them. They're I the best. Them literally six days a week. This is my non. <laughs> you you caught me on the wrong day. Wrong day. Go to sheathunderwear.com and use code DRUNK to get 20% off your first order. Plus, sheath's underwears, 100 money back guarantee. Wow. That's a that's a confidence in a product. That's sheathunderwear.com, promo code DRUNK. Get sheath underwear, support the show, and support your balls. If you're looking for a new book to put on that reading list, check out That Black Pig by Ben Colley. Mm. It's a crazy story that follows Jim Stakes, a successful photographer with a murky past in low-budget porn. When Jim's former colleague dies in a freak masturbation act, Jeez. Jim thinks it might be been, been, been truly an accident. Now I'm nervous that fucking throw. A porn star from Jim's past and a whole lot of booze are along for the ride as Jim tries to unravel the mystery. Well, this sounds really good, man. I like. Oh, yeah. I love a good kind of sleazy noir, so this sounds right up my alley. I'll yeah. check it out. Be warned, though, this book isn't for everybody. It touches on some pretty dark themes, so if that's not your thing, you might want to sit this one out. It's a grim tale of obsession, excess, and unrequited lust that'll have you laughing with every turn of the page. That Black Pig is available on Amazon as a paperback, ebook, or on a Kindle Unlimited. 
And for any We Might Be Drunk listeners in London, order a Black Pig Manhattan at Low Country in Shoreditch. And I'm going to London. I might have to check this uh, out. Yeah. And a big, fat American guy who owns a bar will slip you a free copy of That Black Pig to enjoy with your cocktail. I love that. If you're not in the area, order That Black Pig on Amazon as a paperback, ebook, or a Kindle Unlimited. Wait a minute. Just finished it. It's fantastic. Love it. So he gave me a piece of advice. I was working with him at a comedy club, and I would have a beer on stage on a stool. And uh, one time, you know, I did my show. I walked off stage, and he said, he had like this grass gravelly voice. He goes, hey, Regan, he goes, uh, do me a favor. Uh, don't take a sip from your beer unless there was a laugh before that. <laughs> he goes, sometimes you're doing a joke, and it doesn't get a laugh, and you're still going over and taking a sip. He goes, wait till there's a laugh, and then when the laugh is coming down, you can take a sip. Yeah. He said, earn your sips. Ooh, earn your earn sips. your sips. I love that. And I never forgot that. Yeah, well, that's a real momentum killer if you're just like, so the other day I was at the church. <laughs> <laughs> what yeah, what, 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 doing? yeah what are we doing here no i'm totally no, obvious. I'm, I'm waiting with patiently while you hydrate yeah exactly <laughs> how thirsty are you buddy now where are you at on uh giving notes to the opener uh that's not like an insult or that's not a real critical note that you know sometimes they kind of cut deep well, I would only talk about a particular bit, like if you have a tagline or something like that, something that they've already thought of that I think is good. You know, if you think of a tagline or maybe another way of saying a word here or there. Yeah. But I would never give somebody a performance joke. Oh. I, I mean, you know, like how to perform. Right, right. I don't, I don't know. I don't think I would do that. I'm not, I'm with you, but I had a guy the other day and it, it, it irked me and I had to, I had to put the kibosh What'd on it. What do you say? So this guy brought notes on stage, which, do what you got to do. I get it. Go nuts. I'm not mad about that. But he had the the stool behind him. So he would tell, he would look at his notes after every single joke and he would go, so then my dog shit on the lawn. Oh, oh, gee, oh, gee. The other day I was at the bank. <laughs> uh, they, was they, he they, hidden? Or they stole, he was killing, but the, they stole all my money. Big laugh. <laughs> And then uh, my mom's in town, and she's a bitch. Let me tell you, she can't cook. The whole kitchen blew up. I mean, you get it, but it was my, like... My note would be, why don't you put the stool, <laughs> like, in front of you? Yes, and yes. then And then you can, like, look down without having to turn your back on it. Well, yeah. Hold the sheet. So I would give that performance note. Yes, yeah. I did. I did. Or, or memorize them. Memorize your fucking memorize jokes, your jokes that you wrote. <laughs> that you've, you've, you've got 15 years into comedy. Like, you don't know your act? I get it. You got did, one new one or two. Why did you have them up here? Yeah. And then you can say them without having to look. Yeah, exactly. So that, that it was like a you know 1,500 seat theater. And he's like turning his back to the crowd every That's a fucking weird three move. minutes. Yeah, yeah I couldn't believe it. Yeah. I remember seeing a guy years ago. This is not This is about turning the back on the audience. He would walk on stage with a big boom box, right? And uh, put it on the stool behind oh him. Oh, God, here we go. Radio Raheem, one of my faves. Well, <laughs> you, you, you think that yeah. he's going to be playing music. He was just taping his own act. Oh! That was, was his tape recorder. Oh, that's hilarious. Wait, they, so, what? you know, the little front part that comes out, he'd have a cassette in there. <laughs> what year is this? That's hilarious. This is in the 80s. Okay. It's at the comic strip in okay. Fort Lauderdale. The is sister club big? of the is one in how... the... <laughs> sister club of the one in New York. So, I, I, he, so we'd go on stage, put this big giant boom box down, <laughs> press play and record, turn around, do his act. He had to do more than a half, you know, he had to do 45 minutes. Sure. He never referred to it. At the 30 minute mark, he must, I don't know how he knew, he would stop, turn around, because the tape was only 30 minutes. Oh my God. He'd eject God. it, he'd undo it and flip it, put it back in, press play and record, turn back around and finish his act, and never mention what he did what? or that that was behind him. That's Imagine, hilarious. This guy is a wedding DJ. <laughs> uh, this guy is the father-daughter father, father -daughter dance. Hold on! <laughs> Dude, what the hell? And then he'd finish his set and walk off with his wow, boom box. Wow, that's crazy. That is committed. Yeah. But... I, I guess. <laughs> do, you, do you listen to... Is that how you write? Do you listen to your sets? At that club where I started, I, I, I tape every show. I don't listen to every show. I used to listen to every show, but then I... It was torture. Now I'll only <laughs> listen if I know there's something new or different yeah, that same, I want to go find. Same. same. So the club where I started, I would have a little tape recorder. I didn't want to bring it on stage. I don't want to I didn't want to bring the be the boombox guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I put it in a booth 
off to the side that the comics would sit in. Oh, no. I already, I I already have a bad here. feeling about this. Yeah. Oh, no. So I had it up here, like behind, you know, where you would sit. They introduced me. As they introduced me, they seat people in that booth. So they're there watching my act. I'm new. I've got a tape recorder behind me. They don't know that that's there. I did a joke. It got no laugh. And I hear this guy go, oh, brother. <laughs> In the crowd or, or? The guy right next to the tape recorder. Uh, a, comic, a comic, right? No, 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 no. Oh, it was an audience. They, they actually <laughs> sat with <laughs> Audience oh, brother members. is great because it's, it's not mean. It's not like this guy sucks. It's oh brother, oh, brother. Like that was so bad. I'm like I, I'm I, taking it back. I've never written a joke that was going for an oh brother. <laughs> oh brother, but I, got, but I wrote one. Man, that's tough. I, oh no, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say the worst thing I ever heard was you're bombing, you're bombing, whatever. I'll take it. You suck. Fuck you. Kill yourself. These two older ladies in the front row are in a two top, and they go. It's dead silence in the room after my joke. She goes, this is bad. <laughs> I heard, and she was trying to whisper to her friend, which made it even worse. Because if you say you suck, I can go, hey, kill you, you know, yeah, fuck right. you. But with the old ladies, I was just like, that's just how they feel. Yeah. I had one at the cellar recently. <laughs> I, I was having a really good set, but there was these two women up front who just hated me. And I was like, I'm like, maybe I'm in my head. But then yeah. I kind of like, I'm doing really well. So I'm like, I'm like. I'm like, wow, you guys really hate me. And they kind of were just like shrugged. Like, mm. you know, like, oh, okay. They kind of acknowledge it. Ouch. So then I was like, whatever. And I'm just, you know, trying to have fun with it. Just keep doing the set. Goes well. Get off. I do another set around the corner. I come back. I see them on the street and they just go, ugh, it's him. Oh. And I was like, <laughs> what, what am I? I'm not thrilled to see you either. Yeah, I don't know what to exactly. tell you. And what am I, a serial killer? I told <laughs> yeah. a couple zingers you don't like. And I'm now... not going to hurt you on yeah. the sidewalk. <laughs> I'm just walking past you. <laughs> Oh, it's him. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was the danger, though, when comics used to, like, that was a thing. Comics just started videotaping their sets, and you'd see a camera, and you'd, 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 you'd get just used to it, and you'd be like, man, this guy hasn't written a new one in a while. And then they, you'd see them come <laughs> off and, and press record. You're like, oh, boy. I hope oh, that. true, true, yeah. yeah. But then if you do make the comment and you realize it, <sighs> Then you got to go back and make more comments and make it look like you knew all along. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, I'm busting your jobs, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's a scary thing when you see that iPhone rolling and you're like, boy, this guy's a fucking hack. There's always that moment like, shit, what do we do? You, you should just delete it. And then... Oh, that's not bad. That's smart. So, Who who are like the comics when you were like, I'm mean, sorry, not who, like, who are the comics, but like, what was the first thing that really like took you from you know selling some tickets to a lot of tickets on the road? Was it the was it your first album? Was it the Comedy Central half hour? What was the thing that really here to here yeah. level up? It, it it there was never that. Um, uh, it was gradual. Ah, uh, it was always gradual. Like I never felt like wow, yesterday was one thing and now today's a brand new kind of thing. Um, the first time I remember people coming out specifically to see me was at a – the first national TV thing I did was the MTV Half Hour Comedy Hour. Mm, pull it up. And it was the kind of thing where there was like four comics on the show, you know. Do you remember any of the other comics? I don't. Seems like they did a lot of those. The HBO Young Comedians, they did the Rodney Dangerfield Comedians thing. And apparently MTV did one as well. So it came out. Yeah, there you go. Wow. Oh, my. Oh. We're out for about 20 minutes. <laughs> I finally went back. Is that food ready yet? Drive around. <laughs> Gotta be somewhere. I, I am married. It's totally uh, doing John Fox. It's, it's uh, just for, uh, Mario. <laughs> <Right. laughs> Mario Joyner. <laughs> So I did that show, it came out, and then uh, I performed at a club at, up in Connecticut, and I remember there was these guys watching me, like in the back of the room, and uh, I remember them coming up to me and said that they came out specifically to see my show. Like, it was the first time like I that I drew. I drew four people. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, so they go, hey, we heard it. Hey, that was they, they didn't give you that shit, did they? No, no. Okay. No. Wow, that's pretty cool, though. The first time people come out to see you is pretty great. So 
when this came out, it's my first national TV thing. I was living in Queens. I didn't have a TV. I wanted to watch it. A friend of mine's brother lived in New York City, and I knew he had a TV. <laughs> so I wanted to go watch myself the first time I'm on television. So I go to watch with my buddy's friend. I show up. His My my buddy's brother isn't even there. His roommate is there. Oh, hilarious. Who knows I'm coming, and I'm like, hi, I'm the guy that wants to watch himself on television. Yeah. So I sat down wow. on the couch with this guy behind me who I don't know. <laughs> this comes on, and I'm watching myself like, oh, I'm on national TV, yeah. if you will. The guy behind me didn't laugh one time. Well, he's like, there's some asshole in my house. <laughs> you know? He's worried about that. So I watched the whole set, and then I got up, and I said, hey, man, thanks for letting me use the TV. And he said, yeah, no problem. He didn't like give me one compliment or anything. Wow. And I just left. It was the most awkward experience wow. ever. That's wild. I'd be like, how cool are you? This is all you're on TV. Holy shit. Because yeah. what was it, the late 80s? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Did, did you get recognized off this? Off the ha half hour thing? Yeah. At the time, that's when things started to, you know, where I started drawing a little bit and Wow. I was drawing like four guys at a pop. <laughs> it's so funny how different things were pre-phone and internet. Like you had to really ask people for favors and meet up with strangers. I mean, it was there was so much interaction before. To to get booked at comedy clubs, this was <laughs> show you how long ago it was. This is before tapes. I would take Greyhound buses. I would perform at a club. I would find out the closest city that had a comedy club because comedy was starting to become a thing mm -hmm. and I would take a Greyhound bus to that next city and audition and that's how I would get gigs is taking Greyhound buses from city to wow. city. Wow. You just, you're just taking the bus for a maybe. You just show up. For five minutes? Get on stage, do wow. five minutes. And, and you're auditioning to headline or to feature? Or no, what? just to open or middle. Wow. I wasn't even headlining at the time. You know, yeah. this is just to get booked, period. See, that's the problem with comedy now is it's too easy. I feel like, like as horrible as that was, I'm sure, it weeded a lot of the the, the non-real comics out. Some guys like, I like to do comedy. All right, we'll take a Greyhound nine hours to a place you might get on. He's yeah. like, all right, fuck this. <laughs> a I'll Greyhound be a to do five minutes in Toledo. Yes, yes. exactly. Yeah. And sleep on a floor. Like a country song. <laughs> right, right. I did one. I, I take a Greyhound bus to some city. I do the audition. Uh, the person who booked it, this woman said, uh, I'm kind of full up for now. Call me in six months. Ah! Oh. So I call her. I wait six months. Do so you wait? You took it and you, you just you, let? You, you rode just, there? I took the Greyhound bus to this city. She said, I'm booked up for the short term. Call you didn't, me in you six didn't explain, like, is there any way? I, I, I rode here. No, no, no. Yeah. She let me audition. Oh, okay, okay. I'm sorry. So after the audition, she said, I'm booked up for the short term. Call me in six months. So I call her in six months. And she said, you know what? I'm sorry. I'm already, I booked for the next nine months already. Jeez. Why don't you call me in nine months after that? <laughs> so I can't take a hint. You could have had four kids by then. So I wait. <laughs> it's like, it's eight pregnancies later. So I, to the day, nine months. Wow. I call and I said, hi, this is Brian Regan. I auditioned for you, remember a couple years ago and then you told me to call in six months and then you told me to call nine months later. And well, here I am on the phone and she said well then i guess i lied okay damn <laughs> she like don't you get the hint buddy if six months nine months and yeah, but why why can't she just say the hint why can't she just say you're not right for correct. us that's my opinion yeah you know, wow I, I, even though that would hurt i'd rather you just say yeah, i don't think you're right for the room i'm with her a little you gotta be no. like, you call a girl you want to go out sometime i'm washing my hair that night I'll wait. No, what if she said? <laughs> I'll condition. No, no, no. But what if she said, I'll go out with you in six months? <laughs> I would have tried the first six months that she goes, give me another nine. I would have gone, you know what? I'm going to go gay or, or find another lady maybe. See me, I would have called her the nine months. How about now? You ready to go to the I movies? I guess. Well, good Lord, man. <laughs> Damn. Did you get laid ever? Oh my God. <laughs> You'll get laid in nine months. I had to buy a book on how to take hints. <laughs>
<laughs> how to take rejection <laughs> hints. Uh, wow. You see, that's how hard comedy was back then. It was like being a fucking, like a, a, a singer in a band, you know, but there was four places to do it. It's so bizarre to have your act that you think, you know, you think it's funny, right? You hope, yeah. You hope, and then you stand in front of somebody who's never seen it before, and they watch you, and it's just like an audience, but it's a booker. They they could love it, or they yeah. could go... Did the set go well? I thought it went well that, that yeah. night. Right. Yeah. That's the tough thing, is like it, it is ultimately a booker, right? You have a, you have a good set, that's all you can do. Yeah, of course, but but I'm saying not to sound like a boomer old fogey. I had to walk eight miles in the snow, but like some kid could put a clip up on YouTube, it'll go viral. He's done comedy eight minutes, right? So he's like, "Oh yeah, I'm I'm the king." I did a show one time. Richard Jenny was the headliner. I was oh. the middle act. Richard Jenny's fantastic. One him. of the best. Love him. And uh, is that a comedy club? After the show, the owner, we're, we're, Richard Jenny and I are standing next to each other. The owner points to Richard Jenny and goes. Great set. And then he points to me and goes, and you had a journeyman set. Mm -hmm. And I said, thank you. And I I didn't know what that meant. And I never knew what that meant. And then about t 10 years after that, I was like, I'm going to look up what that meant. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And it meant adequate, but not, not really more than that. Uh, that sucks. But I'm glad I waited 10 years because I took it as a compliment <laughs> for 10 years. I'm like, hey, if you're looking for somebody to do journeyman set, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm your guy. <laughs> yeah, I guess. What a, it, what a weird, weird thing to say to somebody. I was talking about a journeyman dick once. Like, Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. I take that as kind of like, hey, you're younger and you're on your way, but you're, you did fine. That's maybe the direction he was going. Okay, you okay. Know. But a journeyman like baseball player is a guy who's just like kind of hanging on. Like he's on yeah. games, you know, he's like, it's but you, have, you make a career. You're making a career. That's like a, what I was doing at the time. There you go. Hanging on. So he wasn't wrong. No, he wasn't. What was Jenny like? I mean, he's uh, he's like the most underrated comic, never talked about. Really one of the, one of the funniest. Unbelievable He's performer. fantastic. Um, I actually have a an album of his that was made after he passed away. I guess it was stuff that he had recorded and some people put it together. It's not... It's not produced great because you could hear the, that it was cobbled together from different shows, but a lot of funny stuff in there. Yeah. yeah. You got him right there. There he is. Richard he was Jenny. the man. Oh, uh, I, I texted a bit to Mark and Joe Liss the other day from Richard Jenny. I just heard that killed me about, uh, he said, you know what the difference between uh, Charles Manson and every woman I've ever been in love with is? <laughs> Charles Manson has the decency to look like a psycho when you first meet him. <laughs> <laughs> great joke. Wow, that's a great joke. He had a lot of great shit, though. Oh, yeah, Ooh. and he could perform. He was big. He, was he had a whole bit about when uh, NFL referees first started using microphones, because prior to that, you know, they would have just to make the signals. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had this great routine about an NFL ref about to give a penalty and then starting to feel bad that he's judging these guys. And he's like, you know, who am I to judge these guys? Is my life perfect? No. And then he like does this <laughs> self-introspection thing. Right. He does like three minutes of him even lying on the ground at the football going, you know, I, I made a lot of bad decisions in my life. Uh, uh, it's I, just really great. He had that great joke about uh, him and his wife are trying to do anal. And he's like, for some reason, every time I do anal with my wife, she looks like Elvis. Hoo! Ha! Ho! <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Come so on. good. So silly. <laughs> so silly, so simple, but and he would he's so good at the movements too. You can pull that he one. He had it all. I mean he had all the he tool, had it all. all the tools that you yes. want as a comic. <laughs> good jokes, good performer, just everything. Yeah. Woo, still laughing about that one. W was there anyone else you opened for coming up that you were like, shit, this guy is legit? Uh gosh, now I'm gonna blank, but uh yeah, yeah, that, there's a lot of comics out there who became like road comics in the sense that uh, they weren't really pushing necessarily to do anything interesting or right. creative, you know, the kind of stuff that audiences would laugh at that didn't necessarily come yeah. off as unique to the comedy world. You didn't have to think too much, like the Bill Hicks fan. Right. You know, yeah. but you, you uh, I don't want to make you uncomfortable again, but you're a, you're a squeaky clean comic and uh would you ever have a guy go on before you and he's just doing a whole yeah. bit about uh skull fucking or something 
Dennis, my brother Dennis. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> um, when I first started, I thought the philosophy was you should learn to follow anything. Mm. So I always, I never requested to work with clean comedians. You know, it's like whatever I followed, I followed, and I would just do my best. But then it got to the point where sometimes people were coming out specifically to see me. Yeah. And they liked the fact that it was clean. So then I felt awkward having somebody go before me who's filthy <laughs> when that's not necessarily what these people came out to see. That's fair. So I would want clean acts in front of me, but I never wanted to censor anybody. So I would always tell the club, book somebody who's already clean. You know, like I, I don't want you to book somebody who doesn't like to work that way sure. and tell them the night they show up, hey, you got to work clean tonight because I didn't want to do that. So I wanted clubs to book clean acts in front of me, but sometimes the clubs would just book some but anybody, and then that night they would tell them. And right. I could tell some guys would go on stage with a chip on their shoulder because mm -hmm. they were told 15 minutes before the, the show started that they're supposed to work clean. And I'm like, well, that, that's not what I asked for. Right. He's trying to Playing work a, club owner. A, a clean Bukaki joke. He's like, let me just fucking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I could say this instead of that. Yeah. yeah. What, what, what was your reasoning for going clean? I mean, it's like, it's such a smart choice when you're starting out, but like, I, I wish I had that incl it, inclination. It's a difficult sometimes. choice. Yeah. It's, it's way harder to turn out material like you do clean. Yeah. It was never. When I first started, I wasn't completely clean, but I was always 95% clean just because that's how I think comedically. Come on. Everybody thinks buttholes are funny and right. blowjobs. Exactly. That never, Me too. you never had a blowjob joke uh, where you're like, oh. No, I did. I'm saying oh. I was 95% clean. Oh, I okay. had 5% of my act was, uh, you know, dirty stuff. Um, and but, the reason I went 100% was just because of being meticulous, not because of – it wasn't like a statement like, wow, I think clean is better. I'm like, I wonder if I – what it would feel like to just do a whole show without saying certain words or going in certain directions. Mm -hmm. Because I enjoy it. As yeah. a challenge sure. of it, you know, for the fun of it, you know. I see how hard I can get people laughing without this, that, or the other. And I just started enjoying it. But it had. It was never a. Uh, I never did it to get a larger following, or no. you know, like it, it just. But it does happen to have that benefit. Yeah, but yeah, that's sure. not why I did it. You know? Well, Seinfeld said a similar thing. He basically said, "I had a joke where I said fuck before the punchline. It would kill." One day I said, "Let me take the fuck out," and it didn't kill. And he's like, "Well, I'm a fraud." And then let me just see if I can keep going that way. Because then I'll have to actually make the joke funny mm -hmm. instead of using the fuck. And I, I, I would totally respect that. Dennis Wolfberg, great comedian. Yep. Yeah. Used to have a joke in his act where uh, he he was a teacher in, before he became a comedian. And he said that his, his name is Wolfberg and he would have students yell out, hey, wolf shit. And that was the punchline. <laughs> and he would go, no, it's Wolfberg. He had a very weird delivery. Yeah. And then he did that joke on The Tonight Show, and he couldn't say wolf shit. He changed it to uh, wolf butt. Mm. I saw him do the show on The Tonight Show. He said wolf butt instead of wolf shit, and it didn't get a laugh. And I saw the look in his eyes like, that's supposed to kill. Whoa. And that was another reason at the time where I was like, I don't ever want to get to a point where I can't take anything I, that I do and not put it on TV, like if I got lucky enough to do TV spots. Totally. So that was another reason why I decided to go clean. Another good reason. Norm MacDonald well, says clean comedy is more impressive. That's just his opinion. Well, I don't... I, Norm MacDonald is a genius. Yeah, um, it's harder. I it try hard. not it's to harder. go that far with it because there are plenty, com plenty of comedians out there who are dirty or blue or whatever you want to call it, who I think are brilliant. Totally. So I, I, to me, it's just different. It's not better. It's just different. It's yeah. a different way of doing comedy. Yeah, we have genres of music. We have genres right. of comedy, exactly. right? I mean, uh, I, I want to ask you this. Are you the first comic who did the live special? Because I feel like now a lot of oh. other guys are getting the credit, but I, you did a live TV special before. I, I did the that. first live one on Comedy Central. 
Yeah. But I believe I believe Seinfeld had done a live special on HBO. Really? Uh, Telling you for the last time? That was live? Yes. I don't know if that was live. Well, I don't know if that was the one, but oh. I believe he did a live special. Um, really? Before I, but I was the first one to do it on Comedy Central. Well, we have I'm, Google. That is crazy that you, so you did it with commercials. With one commercial. Oh, okay. Mm. Uh, I didn't want any commercials. They wanted to do a commercial break. <laughs> Kind of hard to explain, but um, I didn't want there to be a five-minute break in the middle of my show for the audience. Right, right. So the first 30 minutes, I told the audience before I started, I said, listen, there has to be a five-minute commercial break. I didn't tell them. I had the MC explain yeah. it to the audience. There, so I'm going to finish a joke at the 30-minute mark. I'm going to take a sip of water. I'm going to put it down. Then I'm going to take another sip of water and put it down and then come back and get right into my act. So the second 30 minutes of the live special was delayed by five minutes. Mm. I didn't want the audience to sit there for five minutes and then come back live. So mm. so I just went right back into it and they just held that by five minutes. Got it. Got it. So you didn't sip a water for five minutes. No. Okay. Because you got No, I wanted it I wanted it to help in the editing and the down road. And the, uh. you know, so I took a sip. Took another sip, and I did that for editing purposes. Got to earn the sips. Yeah. Now, wait a minute. What do you got here? Nice. This aired live on HBO. There you go. You were right. Wow. That's... So that was Seinfeld doing a live special on HBO. Wow. That was unheard of. And that was after doing the TV show for years, and he said this is the hardest thing he's ever done in comedy. It was, was that special. It was, it was the hardest thing I ever did as well. Really? There was a laser pointer on his head for a little bit. I remember that. Because it was live and they couldn't stop it. So there was wow. something in the back with a little laser pointer on his head yeah. during that live special. He also Fucking got heckled. with him. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking with him. That's hilarious. And then it stopped. They they caught the guy, obviously. but um, <clears throat> He also got heckled two or three times and handled it all pretty well like he zinged him back and got a huge laugh and uh pretty impressive for live i would be like you, you got me i can't think of anything <laughs> it's live you know it's probably the most nervous i've ever been performing what wow. was your decision to do it because i because i had done specials before um and i wanted to do i wanted to experience it yeah I to see what it was like to give it a go you know what i mean mm -hmm. i don't think i'll do another one <laughs> i mean i yeah. I knock one out. and uh, Yeah. Because if you do screw up, you know, my fear obviously was somebody heckles, somebody does something, you screw up, and there's no fixing it. Yeah. One out. Well, I mean. And then you're going to live with it forever, you know. Obviously, I don't, the famous Chris Rock live special where he was finally going to get Will Smith back, and he had that one flub, and it was live, and it's so devastating to have that big moment where I get to fucking nail this guy who slapped me on TV and then I flub it. Yeah, the jokes are still great, though. The jokes are great, and uh, he's great, but uh, that's a bummer. It's that's tough. What... It live is, is tough. I asked uh, Rogan why. I was like, why Why would you do a live one? And he said, uh, they called me, my agent called me and said, Netflix wants to give you a live special. And he goes, fuck that. What are you, crazy? I'm not doing that. Hung up. And he was driving home, and he's like, what am I? What am I scared? I'm, I'm nervous. Why am I nervous? I'm a professional comedian. And he goes, "Hang on, tell him I'll think about it." And then he did it. While he was driving, he had the like the <laughs> <laughs> old car. <laughs> had the car a I picture him driving in an ice bath, just like <laughs> <laughs> four wheels. Yeah. He was strangling an elk. Hold on, I'll call you back. <laughs> With the phone, like on yeah. the ice bath. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> But yeah, I would not want to do a lot. I'm, uh, I'm yeah, it's not not for me. Ridiculous. Yeah, it's the hardest I've ever concentrated. Like every word, you're trying to nail it. You're trying to enunciate and hit it and hit it and hit it. Well, and and it's weird because like we perform live every time we're doing a show. Yeah, live, and you don't have that fear. It's, it's like true. You could flub in front of, in front of three hundred people, mm -hmm. but it's just the magnitude of it with how many people could be watching. But I got to tell you, it does work because I'm always like, live, who would do a live? And the, the Seinfeld one I watched with my family in the living room on HBO. That was a huge deal. We were all excited, popcorn, everything. I watched the Chris Rock one live and I watched the Rogan one live because I'm just like, I want to see it. It's live. And I didn't it, see it the works. Rock one live only because I saw him in an arena like 
a month ago. Uh, you know, and I was like, I've seen it live. I'm, I already, right. I, I'm, I'm not going to experience it in a better way than being in the room. And I, I sure. enjoyed it a lot when I saw it. So yeah, yeah, it's great, great special. But all the press, like you know, you do press leading up to it, and that was always what people wanted to talk about. Are you worried about? something screwing up or you're worried about there being a problem you're worried about being an issue and i'm like I, i'm kind of hoping that it goes well and that it's just a good comedy show and it, it's almost like people are looking for something to go off the rails i think you're right there's a nascar vibe but that's yeah, i think that's yes. that's the excitement of live i think that's it's what it is you're tuning in you're just like something could go wrong right yeah i think that's why they love seeing comics have to like m manage something fucked up in a crowd. Mm -hmm. Totally, because they know that if they know you, they know they like the jokes, but they want to see like another gear. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Bill Burr had that Philly heckle situation, yeah. and he walked off stage covered in sweat, going, "Well, I just ruined my whole career. That's gonna ruin my career." And meanwhile, it broke him. Right. So. Yeah. The, like the thing I don't like about a situation like that is because then all of the comedy itself. All the stuff that you worked on becomes second secondary to to that moment. I completely so agree. So you could do an hour of stuff that you've worked on for a long time, you're proud of it, and then somebody yells something in the middle of it. You know, you, even if you deal with it and get a great laugh off it, after the show, that's what everybody talks about. And you go, well, yeah. Evan, yeah. what about the stuff you well, know, that it put some effort into? True. I think the problem with comedy, because music, obviously, if you watch live The Beatles at Central Park, you don't want to watch a string pop. You want to watch them kill it. But with comedy, the whole art form is kind of based around quelled fear. Meaning, like, we're all kind of on the edge of our seat. Is he going to bomb? Is he going to do well? It's comedy. A big part of it is tension. Right. And I think so if the tension breaks with a live fuck up, I think that's a a sight to see, and it is the messiest. Like you're not, you're not going to see that anywhere else. Like you, you, it, it doesn't seem like anything ever goes wrong at like a Broadway show, right? But in like a dingy club, something going off the rails, someone you see on TV, there is something kind of cool about. I don't know. Like obviously, I'd rather just do my hour. But when I fuck around at a show, it's like it's at the end of the show. I want to do my show, and then I'll be like, all right, now I'll fuck Same. around with you guys. Same, right, but right. you know. But think about tightrope. You're going. Oh yeah. man, is he gonna fall? Oh, that's the whole enjoyment. Uh, and you don't care about a guy walking. It's the whole enjoyment of the guy who might fall. He gets to the other side. And you go ah, yeah, a little bit. I think a little bit. You, well, you go. That was impressive. He walked on a tight wire. It's tight, tiny rope. But the most still... impressive, Nathan, for you. I don't when remember. He, when he walked a tight wire over the belt, that was the most insane shit I've ever seen. Did he do it? He did it. Yeah. Oh wow. Did it like eight times. You're talking about. What? You know that guy, Nathan Fielder. No. You've never seen oh, Nathan a, for you? Hilarious show. Oh, fuck, he's good. It's a brilliant show. It's kind of meta. It's Yeah, he he trained to do this for a long time. How did I miss that one? Do you stand up? No. No, like, oh, I thought he had a, his own TV show kind of like situational. It's phenomenal. Reality show kind of thing. But he actually figured out like, he did a high wire. He did it. He did it and it with like weird makeup on his face pretending to be another guy. The whole premise of the episode was like he'll find a guy, he'll get him to meet a girl, they'll fall in love, and he'll pretend to, he'll make this guy the hero. Oh. Yeah. So he learned a tight wire. Yeah, pretty brilliant guy. Hmm. Kind of Andy Kaufmany almost, I'd say. Yeah. But for the digital space. But yeah, yeah. yeah so you're right. People want to watch comics fuck up and handle it. What uh, are you still on the road really hard right now? Yes, um, with an eye towards, I don't know, uh, when would I want to wrap up? As much as I love doing what I do, you know, I've been at it a while, and um, I still love being on stage doing it. Uh-oh, um, getting nervous. Well, but, you know, it's like you also want to get out there and travel the world. and eh, put a show, vacation. do a show in the travel you go to yeah, China, throw a show in. Mind. Yeah, that's, that's true. Your mind, that's yeah. true. You can knock then it out. That's also a write-off. Ah, uh -huh, the that's Jew. Right <laughs> slide in there. All right, I'm convinced. All right. Ah, uh -huh, the it's Jew. A it's a great, it's a great sound bite. Ah, <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh, the, the Jew. Jew. <laughs> Where do you want to travel? Uh, everywhere. You know, I figured you'd been everywhere doing shows. No, no I haven't. You haven't gone international, Canada. Done. I did one show in London. Come on. And other than that, I have not performed internationally. 
Wow, I'm shocked. Yeah. I bet you have a lot of fans over there. You in Australia? Oh. Crush. I'd like to I'd like to perform in Australia, but that hasn't happened yet. Mm, I'm I'm surprised. Who's his agent? I call. I, I took a greyhound to Australia. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, so, I'm supposed to be calling him in nine months. Five, five minutes in Melbourne. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see Calls if you're ready. Nine months. Oh, that's great. oh, well, your daughter's in college now, and yeah, you're doing all right. You're a grown up. And you're in. You live in Vegas. Live in Vegas. My son is also in college. He's in. He's in college in in Las Vegas. My daughter's in college here in New York. And uh, yeah, I've been in Vegas for like twenty years. Damn. There's no shortage of places to get up on stage. Uh, but I don't do it a lot. I mean, I uh, like to I, – I don't go and do guest sets a lot. You know? mm. Yeah, what's your home life like? Like you just kind of take it easy at home? I do a lot of crack cocaine. <laughs> Not, <laughs> nice. Do you want another drink, by the way, while we got you here? I don't want to sure. – I mean, I don't want to push you there. I know you got to – Oh, you guys – I was All hoping right. for one, yeah, so I'll, I'll but I, you don't have to have one either. I'm I'll, just, I'll do. I felt uh, you. Were, I saw that empty I glass, the, uh... and I saw your leg twitching. The remainder, after I get this next drink in me, will be all the stuff that goes viral. Ah, well, they want to <laughs> see us. Drunk Brian. They want to see the what, car. What's a, what's a night like at home when you're just chilling? Uh, girlfriend and I hang out. Um, sometimes whoa, at a whoa, casino. Put the liquor in first, you toot, you retard. <laughs> You can't you put the liquor and then the booze. That's fine. Who cares? All right, all right. There's it. Sorry, sorry. I like uh, I like my drink. Uh, I was worried there was gonna be like an explosion. <laughs> I, I didn't know that it mattered one way or the other. <laughs> okay, so your your son's gay. What was that? Did I did I say that? <laughs> no. Oh, that's what I heard. Um, no, just chill out. Uh, play blackjack. Nothing exciting. Okay. All right. Well, hey, you're living the life. That Vegas air, though. I don't know how you do it. I grew up in Louisiana. Hot as shit. Vegas is hotter than that. Oh, God. It's like walking on Mars. Yeah, we Jews don't do well in the desert, man. I crumple up like a fucking <laughs> raisin. Did 40 it's years. Rough. I know, but it wasn't good. That's it's a bad 40 years. <laughs> That's true. Las Vegas just broke the record for heat with 118 degrees. Ah! One crazy. of the days. Crazy. It's the hottest it's ever been in yeah. since they've been recording it. Yikes! How do you? I mean, yeah, I'm sure you got a sick place. I mean, you just got to stay out of that. It's, I mean, yeah. it's crazy. All you need is air conditioning, and you're yeah. good. Don't they have good taxes there? Isn't that a Vegas thing? A lot of people move from California to Nevada because there's no uh, state tax. There it is. All right, that's nice. And Florida. That's why, like, all the athletes live in Florida. Oh. Tiger Woods and all those guys. They like to live in Florida. My understanding is there's no state tax there. Okay, good to know. But I would think, like, if you're Tiger Woods. Thank you. How much? Thank you so much. If you, if you're making a hundred million dollars, say in a year, do you need to save like another four million from state taxes? Like I, yeah. I never understood. I hear you. I think if you're that rich, though, you just find a way to like wherever you're living. You're like well, wherever I, I live will think. be. Sick. I know, but you're just like I'll make I'll make Florida sick. I'll make it great. You know, and I'm with you. I'm I'm not leaving New York, but I I get that mindset too. You know, I will say though, you see that tax chunk missing, and you're like, God damn, that's a lot of moolah. Yeah. Cheers, by the way, round. Yeah. Hey. yeah, hey guys. Yeah, no, no, no uh, peer the, pressure. Appreciate you guys having me on. The what's the cool way of saying it? The cast pod. <laughs> The pod? Yeah, you had you had it back. Can I ask you a question about Vegas? Yeah. Can What's a good, because we go there just for gigs, so what's good non-touristy stuff to do oh, there? Oh, that's a good question. Saw the, uh, I saw the first show at the Sphere. Whoa! Who was that, you two? You two. Yeah. Is it amazing? Uh, uh, unbelievable. Wow. Um, I feel like that's a touristy thing though, right? The Sphere? Yeah, but I wanted to go check it out. I've actually... I saw U2 twice there. Not that I'm a big U2 fan, but I just like to experience what it was like. And uh, the imagery on the walls was incredible. It's crazy. What was the, the, fir the first night, I was telling people the only, <laughs> the only thing that wasn't necessary that night was the band U2. <laughs> <laughs> because they just, you're just looking at the walls the whole time. And the second time I went, about a month later, U2 was still performing there. But they had already changed it. I, I could tell that the band was like, all right, enough with the 
the stuff on the wall. Right, right. I mean, they still have it, but there were plenty of songs where the focus was on them, and then they would just put them up on the wall. Mm -hmm. I kind of like so it was that. more. It was back to this is a, still a concert. Right. Wow. You know, it's not yeah. like going to the movies. There you That's go. That's incredible. Yeah. See, it's really amazing. I would like to perform there, and if I was bombing, I'd go, just look at the walls. You know, <laughs> get, get it off me. <laughs> That's insane. They yeah. say, though, the, the, the venue is actually more of a show than the show. Well, that was kind of my experience. Wow. That's cool. Yeah, Vegas, uh, Vegas. I'm going in two weeks. You, you don't do that wise, guys? You don't pop over there? There's a new one, new club. I haven't been in there, no. What, what, what if I was doing a set? Would you, uh, of course you want to do... A guest set between my two forty fives. <laughs> <laughs> when you flip your uh, cassette around, yeah, oh, yeah, I'll do five while you're flipping your we'll bring boom the boombox cassette. Do you guys perform out there? Yeah, Vegas. He I, just did the win. I did the win. It was really good. It was yeah. really fun. Yeah, I did the Mirage once, but that's gone now, isn't it? Isn't it? It's closing up. I did the Mirage with Ray Romano. That's mm. cool. That's a good show. And uh, now I perform over at the Venetian. Oh, I've nice. heard the Venetian is awesome. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool. It's a uh, it's a good setup for comedy. I mean, it wasn't designed. The, the room I'm in isn't designed for comedy, but uh, it works great. I assume you're out of, you're outside of the town a little. What do you mean? Like the you're strip. not on the strip. You're living not you're you're living yeah, about situation. twenty minutes from. There. Okay, perfect. Yeah, yeah. Well, you ever go to that pawn shop? Pawn I've stars. I've been in there. All right. That... When people when friends and family come out, they always want to go there, and I'm like, what the hell. <laughs> I've watched I to go to more hours place. of that show than my own family. <laughs> what about uh, the Golden Steer? Is that place awesome? Yeah, I gotta, yeah, I gotta fantastic. go there. What about uh, Circus? You know that the um, the Pawn Stars thing? Yeah, you know that they just pump that guy with the all that knowledge information. <laughs> like, nobody, nobody knows all that stuff <laughs> off the top of their head. I know, right? You know, like they hand him like a sword. Yes, and he's like, you know, this is a nineteen, you know, a 1907 <laughs> sword. It yes. was used in uh, France. And exactly. You, you don't know that off the top of your head. He knows <laughs> he everything. Memorized his little thing. Well, he fooled me because I'm like, this guy's amazing. <laughs> he's a wealth of knowledge. <laughs> also, on that show, they always go, uh, "Hey, here's an old jewelry box from the 1500s or whatever," and he goes. All right, what do you want to do? You want to pawn it or you want to sell it? The guy, no one has ever said pawn it. No, not ever. one person has said pawn it. Of course they want to sell it. They want to get a <laughs> bunch of cash, get the fuck out, and go buy heroin. They don't want to pawn anything. No and one's one, coming back to pawn. One thing that apparently people enjoy television wise that I don't enjoy at all is watching the bartering. I don't know why. It makes me uncomfortable. You just you watch a guy go. I'll give you. A, I'll give you two thousand. Yeah. No, no, no. I want, I want uh, five thousand. All right. I'll give you twenty five hundred. No, I want four thousand. What kind of television is this? I All right. I'll give you, I'll give you three thousand. No. How about uh, thirty seven hundred? <laughs> How about uh, I'm on the edge of how my about seat. thirty thirty two hundred? How about thirty two fifty? How about thirty two fifty? Well, the, the worst. Why, get, why is anybody watching this? And then they get personal. They're like, "It was my mom's necklace. She died in a fire. I watched every second of it." And they're like, "All right, I'll give you an extra four dollars or whatever." <laughs> so fucking, I can't watch. It's like, what's the next show going to be? Bank teller? It's fucking awful. <laughs> I, I can't. Every time I come home and my girlfriend's got Bravo on too, I'm like, "Turn it, please." Turn I, the shit it off. makes even, you dumber. Even his background noise, I can't. I'm with it. you. I'll open a book. I'll read the Quran. I can't, <laughs> I can't I, read anymore, man. It's I mean, hard. I can read, but I just there, there's so much that you can just watch that it's hard for me to sit down and read. My my attention span is it's so challenging. It's hard, man. Flights are one of the best places to do it because there's just no there's no other distractions really. You can kind of just zone out, you know. Yeah, totally. I missed the big on a flight. Yes. Those but even then I I'll just put headphones on. And I know. Yeah. It's so hard. Last thing I'll say about Pawn Stars. <laughs> Why do we, I hate how they have to have like a, a plot going with these four idiots in the back. They're like, oh, we need a, we need a story. All right. You, you, uh, you stepped on his foot. You're mad about it. He's pissed. And now you're going to prank him. Just keep on keep it at the pawn shop. We don't I don't these are the least talented people on the planet, these four guys. <laughs> I do not need a plot line and a and a and a, to make it interesting. a story arc with these tards. So as far as That's reading it. on a pay, uh, reading on a plane, 
I'm on a flight one time. Guy next to me has a Sunday newspaper. You know mm. how big that is, right? He's got the whole giant thing. <laughs> he's, yes. He's, he's working his way through it. Boom, 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 boom. I'm over here with my headphones on. I have nothing in front of me. He finishes his newspaper and goes, uh, here, I thought you'd like to read the paper. Whoa. And I said, thank you. Realizing he was giving me his trash. <laughs> <laughs> and I fell for it. And now I've got this big, giant, stupid <laughs> newspaper all over my lap. I didn't want to read any of it. Of course. And I went, this guy played me, man. All I had to do was go, uh, no, thank you. Yeah. You keep your stupid newspaper. Wow. <laughs> then he was like, hey, I figured you'd want my uh, protein bar wrapper as well. <laughs> yeah. And I'm done with this condom also. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah. But now you have to pretend to kind of read then it for I half a second. I have to pretend to read it for a while. Oh. <laughs> Patio furniture's on hey, sale. Oh, wow. Did you know? Did you see that part? Yeah. But then you got to stuff it in that, that flap. I should have that. stuffed it in his flap. Oh, yeah. It's his paper. Also, get an iPad, you Amish weirdo. You know, we still we're still doing the post. I I will tell you, I kind of like an actual like something about an actual magazine now or newspaper or something. I don't know because it's just like I look at the Kindle or whatever. It's like another thing to charge. I know. I just I look know. at another fucking charger. I agree. Charging everything. I got my Every computer, charge. my phone, my fucking <laughs> headphones, my dildo. Yeah. Yes, yeah. all of it. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm with my you. second di bigger dildo. I have multiple <laughs> dildos that run on the road. You know what's really sad is they gave a magazine to like two year olds and the kids are touching the pictures and trying to swipe them in the magazine and you're like, oh, wow. oh we're doomed. We are fucked. They think it's a digital screen. They don't understand. That's amazing. Scary. That's, that's hilarious. You know what gives me hope though? And now we're getting off into, I've had a drink and a half. I'm glad we're at the hopeful part. Okay. You know, <laughs> things are good around the corner. <laughs> okay. You watch a movie, two two hopeful things. You watch a movie, the whole movie has not one cell phone in it, you never notice. I think that's a good sign. I think that's oh. a good sign that we don't really need them. They're not that much right. of a part of our, they're not like a, a hand, you know. If a hand is missing in a guy in a movie, you go, guy's missing a hand. Guy has no phone, you don't notice it. Two, you never dream with your phone. You never in a dream going, <laughs> right? That's I mean, a good side too. Part of the part dream. Of the dream. Is that you're on your phone. Never. Yeah, but you might be on your deathbed, just like you know. That's true. <laughs> right before you die, those are your last thoughts. You're I like, got Fuck. two retweets. Come on. Damn what it. Would the last your last emoji be like if you knew you were dying. I, I assume face. they have a tombstone or something. <laughs> yeah. yeah. True. And so instead of your final words, you have your final tweet. Your final tweet. <laughs> you know what? I hope your doctor says you might die in six months, but. But we'll try again at nine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, can I give you a quick movie rack? Oh, please. I got a quick one for you. Uh, shout out Bill Burr for, for telling me to watch this movie from the 70s called Straight Time with Dustin Hoffman. It's Ooh. fucking awesome. Awesome movie. Straight Time. Harry Dean Stanton's in it. Great. Like oh, every every good I'm character. I'm sold just from oh, the, the, on the cover. List. It's like a, you know, uh, he's fresh out of prison. It's It's a cool movie. Hell yeah. It's really good. All right. Check it out, man. Really fun. Yeah. Oh, look at that. That is is that a Schrader or uh, who directed it? He co-directed it. What? He, I guess he directed it for like two weeks and then was like, fuck this. And someone else came in. <laughs> Hilarious. But uh, no, it's a cool one. And yeah. Harry, every time Harry Dean Stanton shows up in a movie, I'm like, fuck yes. This guy, this guy rules. Totally. Another great movie? Yeah, please. Porky's 3. Get <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Is that a goof? Does it sound like a goof? <laughs> yeah, it does. Yeah. <laughs> oh, poor, did they even make a 3? I don't know. Probably. Oh, <laughs> you got me there. Porky's Revenge. That kid had weird tits, That the nerd kid in the movie. <laughs> Look at that. I mean, that's... That's rough. It's off-putting. He's got beat cups. Now what do you think about Porky? All right, I take it all back. Good writing. Good wreck. <laughs> Whoa, look at that. I don't remember that scene. Hmm. Oh, that's Revenge. I haven't seen Revenge. I will watch that tonight and jerk off. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, remember when a tit in a movie was a tit in a movie? Those days are over. Yeah. It's just not that big a deal anymore. No, we no. A, I'm watching uh, a Pixar. A drive-in movie about, I don't know, a mile away from our house, but the family next door had a tree with a tree house in it, and we would go over there and climb the tree and get in the tree house with binoculars, and we could watch the R-rated movies a mile away with binoculars 
Even with binoculars, it was like this big. Yeah. <laughs> wow. wow. Man, we're not supposed to be doing this. Yeah. Then when you're done with the movie, you can hang the binoculars on your boner. Right. There you Good go. Stuff. A little stand. <laughs> well, <laughs> right, well, yeah, it looks like you're touring here. Where else are you going to be? Well, <clears throat> I don't know. I'm in uh, Eau Claire. I don't know if that's up there. That's tomorrow night. Oh, that's going to be out. Night. What is oh, it, you guys week? are up, moving ahead there. Yeah. yeah, I got some shows. Hell yeah. Like Wheeling, West Virginia, Munhall, Pennsylvania. Munhall right is near Pittsburgh. Yeah, right outside. We got Hershey. Got to check out that chocolate factory. We got mm. uh, Philly, October mm -hmm. 18th. See Brian in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. The Hippodrome. Oh, nice. Charlottesville, uh, Virginia. Boston, classic. Wilba. Oh, yeah, one of the best. Gardner, Maine. Binghamton, which is where my mom and dad were born. Oh. Oh, and they got the hell out of there and went to Florida. That's what they did. Smart. Niagara Falls, Albany, all over. Yeah. I mean, go to, is it BrianRegan.com? Yes. BrianRegan.com. See Brian on the road. One of the best guys. So One of the go best. See him. Thank you, guys. Living legend. I just, I right now, I'm, I am I got a big tour coming in January, uh, late January, but uh, yeah, I'm doing Spokane, Washington in uh, October 24th through 26th, and then I'm doing Hilarities in Cleveland November 1st, 21st through 23rd, but I think we're doing a theater tour starting in, uh, I want to say late January. I will be coming everywhere, so just go to my website. Uh, it's going to be fun. Samorel.com or punchup.live slash Samorel, punchup.live slash Mark Norman for his dates, and uh, yeah, I'm hitting like every city, so just go check it out. Mark, where are you going to be? Hey, Newport, Rhode Island, Monterey, California, Oakland, California, Winnipeg, uh, Edmonton, Cleveland as well. Right before you, going to sneak out those tickets. Fayetteville, Wichita, Kalamazoo, Chicago Theater. That's a big That's one. A Poughkeepsie, Torrington, Connecticut, never heard of it. Charleston, Asheville, NOLA, Wilkes-Barre, and Inglewood. Winnie just farted. Me. That's a bad fucking fart. Really? That's a bad, oof. You, it's going to hit you in a sec. I can't wait. Uh, all right, well, yeah. thank, thank you. You guys Brian. ever do shows together? No, nah, not yeah. really. We'll give it a go somewhere. It'd be fun. We could. Yeah, People are doing do that a, now. Do a show together. Do a podcast on the stage. People would eat it up. Yeah. yeah not, we just, I, we, I'm, I don't love doing live podcasts. You don't either, right? I mean, they're... It's work, yeah. but uh, I'll, I do. I have another pod. We do them pretty yeah, often. With lists. Yeah, with Yeah. We just do them in clubs and do an hour. You get your... You check, you high five a few people, and you you bail. It's nice you don't have to prepare. Mm. Like with this, you gotta have an act. You know, with stand up, with with pods, <laughs> you can just go up and bullshit, and that's kind of nice. <laughs> well, anyway, hey, uh, you gotta start coming, a pod. Man. No, come on. I I I I would not be able to talk for more than five minutes. <laughs> well, you just did it. Yeah, you got a million stories. I no, I I would not be good at it. Yeah, I, you... I admire people who do podcasts. I. Could never do it. Um, you have a guest on. You do your. You get your Vegas out. You do your crack, and you're good to go. Yeah, you throw in Porky's Revenge. You just yeah. riff. You let the good times roll, man. I can't. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm wired as a stand-up, and no, I the podcast it. world came along after I'd been doing it for a while. I really do admire people who do it, like you guys. But uh, I, I don't know that I would have anything to say. I don't. Uh, all right. Well, you got a full head of hair. I would have a. <laughs> I, I'll call. I'll I'll do my podcast full head of hair, Regan, <laughs> and it'll be one minute long. What? I'll have like a one, a one minute podcast. That's not bad. Right. I like that. So, hey, how you doing, Brian Regan? Here, I got a full head of hair, and I'm going to be in Eau Claire Tuesday. Thanks for listening in. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow on the One Minute Podcast. <laughs> well, that's all I need to come. That was like 20 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> see? I want 40 see? more seconds. That's why I can't. Yeah. I, feel... <laughs> I wouldn't be able to fill the other 40 seconds. When the hair go white? What happened? You see gray. something? Gray. I, I, I had gray hair for many years, but I was coloring it. Like I oh, went prematurely gray. Oh, I didn't know that. I went prematurely gray. I don't know what uh, what age, but I've been. I was coloring my hair for... 20, 30 years? I don't know. What? Like in my early 40s, I think. Wow. I started going gray. I had no idea. But I hated it, you know, yeah. having to color my hair. It's cool. That, you know, uh, and, I, and, and uh, during COVID, I'm like, I'm not coloring my hair. And then when shows started opening up, I'm like, I'm not coloring my hair for, to, for these shows. And then I'm like, I like it. 
And it looks I cool. This, I thought maybe this would grow in brown. <laughs> the same color. Yeah, yeah. I remember the first special with the white hair. We were all like, shit, did he did he see a uh, ghost? I mean, what happened? <laughs> but uh, yeah, you're, you're in the Steve Martin Club. Yeah. Yeah, well, go see uh, Brian, one of, one of our faves. Thank you. And, uh, and drink Bodega Cat, guys. Yes! Legal in New York right now. We've got distribution. Uh, see us on the road. And uh, if you want to get this, I don't know, DM the Bodega Cat Instagram or something, or yeah, we gotta we gotta get it back in stock. Yeah, we're, no, we're back in stock. Oh, we are. Okay, that's great. our whiskey. Your booze? Yeah, yeah, we sell it. It's our hooch. So if you need any, we should have uh, been doing this. Well, we well, wanted Woodford. We, we don't want to, you know. Woodford's... I would have done this if I had known. Next time, uh, come back on. We'll drink we'll have Bodega you back Cat. In six to nine yeah, months. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening, guys. <laughs> Oh, what is literally it? just got in? Yeah. Wow. That? We'll see. That'd be funny if it was Santino. Oh, we got to put that one in. Hell yeah. Sammy. Mark. Look at that apartment. Wow. And we might be drunk. Congratulations on 200th episode. That's crazy. Hopefully your livers can last for the next 200 Let's go. Hell yeah. Short and sweet. And I, I hope Edelman never smokes weed because his eyes are already tiny. Imagine <laughs> <laughs> if he was high. But uh, look at that apartment. That's a I fucking it. Yeah, it's got a bachelor. Spot. I got I to gotta swing by. Is that in New York? LA. Oh, I was going to say, wow. That's a beauty. Love the wood walls. All right. Thanks, I got, guys. I got wood walls and wood balls. All right. <laughs> hey, Sam. Hey, Mark. It's Rick Glassman. And Alvin and I just wanted to say... Congrats on 200 episodes. That's right, good boy. Hey, um, in post, make the uh, make the dog's mouth open up and down in heaven and say, happy 200th episode. Oh, fuck, how do I turn this thing off? Where's the fucking... Sunday's the day for my next fender. A bit of fever wreck, you know the beer juice close. I've had a little too much bourbon and Norman's talking shit about the fucking post. Doesn't look like I remember her